Hey, what's going on, humans? It's March 22nd, 2021. I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report Direct Message. And if you want a little insight, into the inner workings of how the Rubin Report team operates, how we prepare for this show. My producer, Michael, just turned to me 10 seconds ago and said, no Nazi jokes today, no F-bombs. Can you do that, Dave? I don't know, I don't know. We're actually gonna find out. That will be the test of the next 30 minutes of my life. We shall see. I'll give you a little more insight into how we do things. I, I think I've mentioned this once or twice. The way we select the stories and the way we figure out what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it, is that throughout the day, as I'm on Twitter, unfortunately, and whatever other places I'm getting news, I just send things to my guys' emails throughout the day, like, oh, this is a story I'm interested in, or this is an image or a meme that I saw, whatever it is. And then in the morning, Michael and I go through everything and we pick things, and as you know, I like to do only like three or four stories, because I'm not trying to just club you over the head and keep you crazy and angry like everybody else. I want you to be happy and enlightened and live your life. Bananas, I know. Uh, Anyway, usually we go through a list of about six or seven stories, but there was so much craziness this weekend, and I guess it was sort of the end of last week, just kind of bled into the weekend, and then there were like a whole bunch of viral things and Biden falling and everything else, that we had 16 stories to go through this morning. Uh, We have whittled it down using our professional, professional whittling machine. We've whittled it down to three key stories that I think will set us up for the week. Uh, Before I get into all that, guys, uh, as always, click that subscribe button and that notification bell, and then maybe, just maybe, if the YouTube overlords are feeling it, you're gonna see our videos, who knows? Uh, All right, we're not doing any ads today. We're we're rolling straight through, people, so here we go. So the big story, number one, or I'll tell you what the three stories are, and then we'll do them. So we're gonna cover Trump apparently launching a social media platform, that's that's the word, on the street, Uh, so we're gonna cover that, number one. Number two, Joe Biden, remember the guy that fell the other day, the guy with dementia that we're pretending is in charge of America? Uh, He's got kids in cages, but we don't call it kids in cages because he's a nice Democrat, he's not orange, he's not a Republican. So we're gonna call it different things, but now all these pictures are leaking of these cages, and they're cages, and there are kids in them, so we're gonna cover that. Uh, And then the by far best governor in the United States, uh, in Florida, you know him, Ron DeSantis, Uh, He is banning critical race theory in their public schools, which is absolutely phenomenal. We've got some video, and he, in effect, is what a governor is supposed to be. He's letting people make decisions for themselves. He didn't destroy his state. He's actually saying, hey, we're not going to teach horrific ideas in our public schools that are counter to the founding of the United States, all sorts of stuff. Uh, So those are the three stories that we're doing today. I am focused. I'm ready to go. I'm caffeinated. Here, watch this. Let's do it. Uh, So yeah, Donald Trump apparently is getting back on the social media. Now we know after the January 6th Capitol Hill riot situation, he was banned from Twitter, he was banned from YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, Spotify. They don't want him posting pictures of apple pie or listening to music. He was basically just annihilated everywhere. I think his official email list had problems. Like just, there was a digital assassination. And it doesn't matter whether you love Trump or hate Trump. It was, a, it was a crazy move, and you know, a lot of people talk about, do these guys coordinate? How do they, how do big tech all decide to coordinate? Like, they obviously didn't come up with this decision completely on their own, like within an hour, everybody boots him at one time. Uh, one time I talked to Peter Thiel about this a couple of years ago when I had him on the show talking about what happened to Alex Jones, and you remember there was a digital assassination of Alex Jones way back when, and again, this has nothing to do with the person's thoughts or feelings or any comment even on Trump, or Alex Jones, but when we watch these people get taken out and you see who applauds it, and it's like, guys, do you not realize they're not done yet? Like these people that like to ban people, they never they never ban people and they're like, all right, we're closing up shop, everybody. Let's go, we're wrapping it up. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. No, they go for more people, right? It's blood in the water and they go for more people. But what Teal said to me was, it's not as much that they all coordinate as they're all sort of cowards. And then once someone makes the first move, everybody else follows. So in the case after January 6th, when Trump got booted, I don't know what the order was in terms of bannings. I believe it was Twitter first, but I know you guys will correct me if I'm mistaken. But then, you know, the rest, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, uh, YouTube, everything else. So Twitter, and then the rest of them go, uh, that it's not really like coordination as much as just cowardice and people following. 
Well, in any event, Trump has been gone from social media. The, the only way he's getting his messaging out right now is he releases these sort of tweet-like, very short press releases from the office of the former president or something like that, whatever they're calling it. And then people then tweet it, which is sort of hilarious. I mean, if Trump really wanted to like truly troll the entire system, he should just be in effect tweeting all day by just every day releasing like five or six or, or 10 or 20 uh, press releases that, and then just get everyone else to, to retweet them all day long. Like at what, what are they gonna do at that point? Just ban everybody? I mean, maybe that's where this is all going, right? We're just gonna ban everybody. Uh, but over the weekend, it was announced, at least subtly, I guess not so subtly, we'll see, you decide. I report, you decide, uh, that he's gonna be back on social media in about two to three months, launching his own platform. We've got some video from Fox News. Former President Trump hasn't been on social media in months after being kicked off Facebook and Twitter, but earlier today on Media Buzz, Trump's senior advisor, Jason Miller, says that we could see him back online in a different way. I do think that we're gonna see President Trump returning to social media in probably about two or three months here with his own platform. And this is something that I think will be the, the hottest ticket in social media. It's gonna completely redefine the game. Jason Miller adds that several teams of people have approached the former president to build that new platform. No word just yet on exactly what this new social media platform will look like. All right, so I think it's pretty clear why I wanted to cover this story. I mean, in a way, this is sort of the biggest story of the day because so much of our lives is dictated by what big tech and, and mainstream media allows us to see or not to see and the way we're manipulated by the algorithms and everything else. Uh, I should preface this all by saying that this week, you know, I've been telling you guys for a couple weeks now that uh, we've got a lot going on with locals. This is a huge week for locals. We've got a ton going on. And I promise you one week from today, which I guess will be the 29th, am I right? Am I right on that? It will be the 29th of March. I will make a bunch of uh, announcements because I've been teasing some stuff and we've just got a huge week for locals that I can't just divulge everything right now, but a lot of good stuff. But the reason I start with that is because I know how difficult it is to start a tech company. Uh, and I know about the never ending litany of problems that you have as a tech company, whether it's philosophically how you wanna deal with free speech issues, whether it's technologically how you wanna deal with storage and servers and payment processors and all of these things. And whatever Trump is doing, whoever has approached him, I have no doubt that they're discussing all of these things. I have no doubt that I've probably talked to some of these people, right? Like I spend most of my days in meetings talking to all of the people in the tech world and how do we solve all these problems in decentralization and everything else. Um, Trump will have a couple really unique problems just to Trump because in effect, Trump the person, not the platform yet, but Trump the man is not allowed on these platforms at the moment. So will Apple suddenly allow his platform as Jason Miller called it, he's calling it a platform. We do not describe locals as a platform, by the way. I always tell lo with locals, we're building you a home. And what you do with that home is up to you. You're gonna set the rules, you're gonna own everything the same way that somebody built the house that I live in. Uh, I am, he's no longer responsible for what goes on in my house. So locals just has a very different, more decentralized approach to everything. So I don't know exactly what Trump's gonna do, but Jason Miller did say the word platform there. So if he tries, let's say he creates really a fantastic system. Let's say he solves 99.9% .9 of the issues. Well, can he get on the app store? Can he get into the Google Play store, which is the Android store, uh, can he deal with the fact that it's very possible that Amazon could take out his servers? Is he gonna buy a huge server farm somewhere in Utah or somewhere in Eastern Europe? Uh, how's he gonna deal with payments if say Stripe or whatever credit card payments he wants to use if they won't allow it? There are massive, massive problems. I have no doubt that they're working on these problems, but I think this is gonna be super interesting. And I also think that, you know, as someone that's, that's in the tech world now, I love competition, man. Like more, 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 more. Like let's just all keep creating. And then what you, what you see happens is some of these companies will pivot, some of them will change what they're doing. I think it's possible that one of the things that's gonna happen here is Trump Jr. has been posting on Rumble a lot. If you guys don't know what Rumble is, it's uh, I believe at least partly owned by Dan Bongino, who at least partly owns part of Parler. Uh, so uh, Jr.'s been on there a lot. That's kind of a hint that maybe the family is up to something with Rumble. Maybe, maybe Rumble and Parler are gonna become one thing. You know, there's so many interesting things happening right now. Like I think Locals has sort of led in the community-based 
video and audio situation. I think you've got, uh, you know, something like, um, what's it called, Stu uh, Substack for just written word for journalists that are leaving the dinosaurs of the New York Times and everything else. You know, there's places for pure audio that are like, uh, like Clubhouse. That So there's just like so much happening. I just think it's a fun, rich space to be in. And the part that really is interesting to me is like, okay, you have a, like for all of us, the, like the, the regular average people, for you guys watching this and, and for me as someone that's in the game but trying to solve some of the problems, I just know there, like there's so many philosophical, legal, ethical, moral, you know, what do you do about, okay, so you decentralize everything on your system and then what if somebody starts putting some horrible stuff up there, like some seriously evil, illegal stuff? Are you then responsible for it? Are they responsible for it? Like there's so many issues um, that I've actually spent so much time discussing over the last couple of years, but especially over the last few months, that it'll be interesting to see what play Trump can make. And then when you add the fact that already this guy has been booted off for everything, and it's like, how will the system react to him, right? So if the system goes, well, Trump, Trump is too dangerous to be on any of these things, then why would they let his platform be on all these things? And they can they secure it, whatever he's building, if assuming he's building it and requiring whatever it is, it's like, can he secure all the data in a way that it's not just gonna be used to steal user data, to expose people? Like there's so many things. Anyway, I obviously think it's incredibly interesting and we'll keep talking about it. Uh, and I just wanna be totally clear, competition. I love competition, I love new ideas, I love new people getting in the game. And, and let's play, let's do it. All right, story number two, which is really what's catching fire uh, at the moment, is that some photos have been leaked from inside a US Customs and Border Protection temporary overflow facility in Donna, Texas. So we're gonna show you some images in just a second, but let's remember before we get into any of this that, uh, remember when, when Orange Man that we were just talking about with the crazy hair and everything, remember when he was pregnant? Pre <laughs> <laughs> remember when he was president? Oh, Lordy. Remember when he was president? Um, remember we were all talking about kids in cages. It was a real thing that we were worried about. There are kids in cages. AOC was concerned about kids in cages. Every mainstream media will be putting kids in cages. He's separating families. He's orange. He's evil. Hitler. Ah, Hitler. I said Hitler. Damn. Um, well, anyway, now that Biden's doing it, it's a little bit different, of course. Uh, let's start with a quote from CBS before we show you the images. More than 13,000 unaccompanied migrant children are now in U.S. custody, sources told N uh, CBS News. Now we've got one quote from Fox, and then we'll show you those images. More than 9,400 children and teens entered U.S. border custody in February, according to data from U.S. Customs and Border Protection. That marks a 60% rise from January. So actually come back to me for one second before we throw those images. Now, you may remember, remember a couple weeks ago, I think we played a video. This is probably about six weeks ago now. We played a video where I believe it was Jen Psaki uh, basically saying to people, oh, don't come yet. Like you'll be able to come at some point, but don't kind of come yet, which is this constant wink to people saying, just come. In essence, you're saying just come, right? Um, so now let's, let's throw you a couple images. These are images from inside the Henry Kuehler, uh, no, I'm sorry. These are images from the facility that I, uh, rep, that I referenced a moment ago from Representative Henry Kuehler, who's a Democrat in Texas. So there you're seeing a couple images of the amount of people. We're seeing people in those silver, I guess they're blankets. They, they really look like bags. I mean, they look pretty freaking dystopian. This is at the temporary overflow facility in Donna, Texas which is the place in essence where they were telling us these are kids in cages. Now those kinda look like cages. Can we put them up again? Yeah, yeah, those are kinda cages and they're sort of locked in there and they have weird silver bags on them. Looks very futuristic and kind of evil. You know, there's a nice garbage can, but a lot of people in there. I wonder how COVID safe that is. I don't see any, I don't see a lot of masks from what I can see. I don't see a ton of social distancing. Very disturbing, but the way the media of course is handling this is we're not talking about kids in cages. Now it's a temporary overflow facility. It's much like the Four Seasons in Bora Bora. It's quite lovely because the Democrats are in charge, not the evil orange man. Well, now let's show you that photo of AOC. This was a famous photo that went viral. This is AOC. This is months ago when she went to the overflow facility, which she was calling 
kids in cages and she compared to the Holocaust and all of that stuff. And she stood out there. And by the way, she's in an empty parking lot right now. She's not really seeing anything. She's seeing a building, but she covered her face and she wore all white and it was a very sad, it was a very sad thing for her to see. Uh, she hasn't said anything about Biden's kids in cages. Of course, the good and wonderful and my good friend who just launched a new show on uh, Daily Wire, she recreated it, that's Candace Owens. She went to a fence as well because fences are all over the place. You can get fences almost anywhere now, the old chain link fence and Candace put on all white. She put her hands to her face and she recreated that very emotional moment that AOC had. There we, there we go, look at these two, boy, oh boy. Who, who was more emotional truly? Uh, anyway, I play that partly because I just wanted to give Candace a little bit of a shout out because her new show did debut on Daily Wire. Was it last night? Did it debut last night or on Friday night? Um, but, and I'll be on it by the way, I'm going to Nashville, I think at the end of the month, I will be on Candace's show. Um, but I wanted to really show you that because it's like, this is another, remember last week we talked about how, or we talked about it all the time, but pretty extensively last week about how the media, depending on who's in charge, they decide what to cover and how they're gonna cover it. So when it was Trump, it's kids in cages, it's the Holocaust, it's, it's evil, it's extermination. I mean, all of these, you know, it's inhumane, all of these things. Now it's, it's very hands off. I should clarify, AOC actually did criticize Biden a little bit at the end of February, but obviously not nearly as hard as Trump and don't expect that that's gonna come and don't expect that she's gonna make any of these over the top comparisons or anything like that. And, and this is just another one where it's like, you, it's up to you, I would say, to decide how it, whether you care about these kids in cages or these migrant facilities or what are we supposed to do with these people. I mean, my feeling personally at this point, and I, I don't think this is, uh, well, I can assure you it's not racist and it's not xenophobic or anything else, but my general feeling would be, we have major problems in the United States at the moment. We've got some stuff to deal with, right? We've got whatever's still going on with COVID and lockdowns. We've got major economic problems. We have a major mainstream media problem. We have major political strife. Like we've got some serious stuff to deal with here first. I would like to deal with what's going on in our home. And the United States, if you live here legally, it is your home. I would like to deal with the inner workings of our family in that regard first. Like let's figure that out. And then if we want people to come or not come, then they can. But this idea that we just have to let people in, and now they're saying maybe they're gonna ship some of them from the border facility up to some states in the north, and like just like a series of crazy things. It's like, we've got stuff to figure out for ourselves first. That is not, that is not mean, it is not xenophobic, it's not racist. Uh, you know what it is? It's, it's a little bit of Jordan Peterson, right? It's a little bit of fix yourself and then fix the world. But we have a whole series of people and a media elite and a, and a entire Democratic Party, that if only we could fix everything else, uh, then we can fix ourselves. That's not how it works. You gotta fix yourself first. So to me, these people, if you come to our border, sorry, you gotta go home. We can't put you in our temporary facilities and give you our silver blankets. Like, no, you, you gotta go home. You gotta go home. Now, if there are actual instances where people are being hunted down, then, you know, by gangs or whatever, maybe something like that. But even on The View this morning, they had some MSNBC correspondent saying how this also has to do with climate, the climate crisis, which is exacerbating the situation so that people have to come to America. It's like, if, do you get it yet? Do you get it? It's a load of bunk that's just being sold on us endlessly. Anyway, we'll obviously keep, keep talking about that, but let's move to my favorite governor in America and one of the top 10 Americans. There, I said it. He's one of the top 10 Americans that we got in America in 2021. Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, who largely kept his state open, who did not destroy all the businesses, who let people go to work, who has the second oldest population in the entire United States, and yet somehow their death rates were lower, and all of the stuff that I've been talking about for months well, he's, he's even one up in me on all of that because he is now banning critical race theory from public school classrooms in Florida. This is, this is as good as it gets. You wanna see what leadership is like? Take a look. Florida civics curriculum will incorporate foundational concepts with the best materials, and it will expressly exclude unsanctioned narratives like critical race theory and other unsubstantiated theories.
let me be clear, there's no room uh, in our classrooms for things like critical race theory. Teaching kids to hate their country and to hate each other is not worth one red cent of taxpayer money. So we will invest in actual, solid, true curriculum, and we will be a leader in the development and, in, and implementation of a world-class civics education. There's a leader. There's a leader, right? That is someone saying, the buck stops with me, I'm drawing a line in the sand, and we're not gonna teach this bunk that is rotting out every institution in the United States. That line, there is no room for critical race theory. Teaching kids to hate this country and hate each other, which in essence is what critical race theory is doing. You know, in the last couple of days, we're hearing this, this new meme of, um, you know, stop the hate against Asian people because of the shooting that took place last week, which by the way, did the guy did kill two white people too, but I know that mainstream media doesn't care about that. Do you know who hates Asian people? Who doesn't want to treat Asian people equally? It's not anyone on the right. I have, ne I have been to conservative fundraisers. I've been to, I speak at conservative events, libertarian events. I've been to turning point events, Ayn Rand Center events. I have never, ever heard anyone say anything remotely anti-Asian ever, period. Like if anything, if anything would ever be brought up, it would be like, oh, look, look at Asians succeeding, succeeding in all of the things, right? Like they're doing the American dream. It's pretty freaking spectacular. I have never once heard even the slightest anti-Asian sentiment. Do you know where anti-Asian sentiment comes from? And this is directly linked to critical race theory, of course, because of the collectivist ideas that we're gonna group people based on these, on these immutable characteristics. The left, almost wholly, the woke left has become racist against Asian people. The same people saying, don't be racist against Asians. These are the same people who want quotas. They want quotas at schools. So we are seeing Harvard, I mean, I know you guys know this, but we're seeing Harvard actually discriminating against Asian people. That is coming from the left, the liberal institutions that are doing it. We now see this is happening all over the place. New York City's best charter schools are now They've had a lot of Asians, so what's happening? Because Asians work very hard and care about family and are doing the American dream properly, we've gotta punish them. So we're breaking down meritocracy. We see this happening in San Francisco, we see it happening in Los Angeles. So, and then what are we doing? Are we actually, by, by doing that, and, and what the critical race theory people would tell you, what the wokesters would tell you is, oh, we're helping black people. But it's a two-way street. You can't just help people without hurting other people, right? So you either, the only thing you can do in a fair society is go for equality, and then the best ideas win out. The people who work the hardest usually win out. The people who are trained the hardest, who have the best families, who come, who do it all right, it's, it's the best shot you got. That's all a society can do. But the very same people who are saying no Asian hate right now, which of course, I believe in no Asian hate, obviously, but the very same people who are saying it are the ones who are, who are actually systemically putting it into our institutions and saying discriminate against those Asian people because they've had it too good. That is a huge freaking problem. And on top of the fact that if you were to look at almost all of the instances, uh, this event last week notwithstanding, if you were to look at almost all of the instances that are happening, especially uh, in the San Francisco area, related to attacks on Asian people, they happen to be coming from black people. So that is not a blanket condemnation of black people, but do you think that if you tell people, oh, those Asians, they've got it too good, right? And you've been oppressed. Do you think that might turn a certain amount of those people on the Asian people? It might, it might, right? Like that's just reality. So like just try to be aware of these things and then you can think clearly about what's going on here. Folks, I, I felt good about today's show. I hope you felt good about today's show. Uh, we've got shows every day this week, as we're one to do. Uh, by the way, I've got an interview coming tomorrow, which we just taped. It's, it's super interesting. Lawrence Fox, who's an actor, he's a British, very well-known British actor, who a couple years ago, about two years ago, basically got canceled for saying some basic liberal stuff. Have we been through this story before? Almost got canceled and then has decided to fight. Because what I always tell you guys, I like fighters, not just people who talk, but people who fight. Well, he started a new political party the Reclaim Party, to reclaim liberalism, true liberalism, 
which I would say is basically modern conservatism, but we can argue about that separately. Uh, he started a new party and he is actually running for mayor of London. Um, so I can't wait, if you, if you don't know Lawrence Fox, I can't wait to introduce you to him. Uh, part one will be out tomorrow. Of course, our full interview from last week with uh, David Sachs is up on YouTube and uh, on my Locals channel right now. And if you wanna play along, I, I posted a lot of dog pictures, a lot of food pictures. I chatted with people this weekend. We posted nature pictures. We got several hundred people, just nature. And no fighting, no trolls, no bots. We built something good and I look forward to Donald Trump getting in the game. More is better. All right, guys, roomreport.locals.com. Make sure you're subscribed right here. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.